did that by accident. Good evening, everyone. Please take your seats. We are ready to begin the program. I am Joseph Booth, Executive Director of the Stevenson Disaster Management Institute of the Louisiana State University. Thank you for joining us tonight for a compelling and timely discussion of the fiscal, economic, and social challenges for Japan in the aftermath of the Tohoku earthquake. I want to commend the Center for Strategic and International Studies on the tremendous effort they put forth in bringing this program and panel of experts together tonight so quickly. This program is the fourth in a series entitled the CSIS LSU series on disaster management and emergency response. I would also like to thank Ms. Lori Burtman of the Pennington Family Foundation for their support of this series and for making this possible. We've all been saddened to watch the media reports of the unfolding events in Japan following the, tra the tragic Tohoku earthquake and tsunami. Our thoughts and prayers are with our Japanese friends. In the aftermath of one of the most complex and natural environmental disasters of our lifetime, we struggle to understand the dynamic interconnections between the diverse hazards and the ramifications. We are hopeful that even in this early stage, the setting of priorities now will set the stage for a rapid recovery for the ultimate reconstruction of Japan. As a veteran of numerous disasters which struck Louisiana, I saw firsthand how devastation in one area can have the cascading effect of causing consequences over a much larger venue. I also observed that quick and decisive action can mitigate consequences and initiate an effective recovery. But more importantly, it is preparedness, both as a practice and as a cultural ethic, which determines the final outcome. Japan is perhaps the most prepared of all nations against the threat of earthquake and tsunami. Even so, Japan faces enormous challenges in her recovery, and this is the focus of tonight's panel. Your moderator for this panel is Michael J. Green, Senior Advisor and Japan Chair of CSIS. He is also an Associate Professor at Georgetown University. Mr. Green, would you introduce your panel? Um, thank you uh, very much. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you, Colonel Booth and our colleagues at Louisiana State University and the Pennington Family Foundation. I think I speak for all of us at CSIS when I uh, say how much we appreciate this series on disa disaster uh, prevention and response. And, and how much I think it will mean to uh, our Japanese audiences that um, New Orleans is here uh, today to uh, express solidarity with the Japanese people and offer what lessons there may be from that tragic experience a few years ago. This uh, is, as Prime Minister Khan has said, the biggest crisis Japan has faced since the war. Mm -hmm. The toll is going to be over $200 billion uh, by conservative estimates mm -hmm. and probably over 20,000 souls lost. Um, the psychological toll will be harder to measure. Um, Japan went into this disaster <clears throat> with some challenges for, for its economy. Those in some ways have been highlighted, the demographic problem. Overwhelmingly, the, the, the people lost in this tsunami have been uh, towards 70 years of age. <clears throat> um, but the response has also highlighted some real strengths in Japan's society and economy that have often been forgotten in the narrative in the Western press over the last few years. Um, just the fact that um, there is a critical shortage of silicon wafers and other critical high technology materials demonstrates uh, the dominant niche Japan continues to have in global production uh, chains uh, in, in critical high tech areas. Uh, the world has really marveled, even uh, 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 I, I would say even the Xinhua and the People's Daily have had editorials praising <laughs> the stoicism and determination and preparedness of the Japanese people for this. And there have been highlights of, uh, of real um, uh, courage um, and activism. The self-defense forces uh, have received universal praise. Uh, Japanese youth, which was once dismissed as kind of listless and lacking for, uh, for, uh, for, for motivation and dismissed as uh, herbivores in the Japanese press, has really mobilized and really galvanized a sense of purpose with this. The key question, of course, will be uh, economic recovery. Uh, that will determine. Um, uh, in the long run, whether this uh, disaster um, changes Japan's role in the world. And we're going to talk primarily today about um, economic recovery uh, and, uh, and reconstruction. Although we'll touch on uh, the energy situation, we'll touch on disaster relief lessons, we'll touch on 
the social and psychological and civil society repercussions. Um, before I introduce my um, fellow panelists, I also want to um, highlight for you um, the announcement uh, uh, yesterday in Japan uh, of the um, uh, Fuku Inkai, the Recovery Committee mm -hmm. uh, for Japan, which will be chaired by uh, Mr. Yoni Kura, the chair of Keidanren, the Japan Business Federation. Well, we at CSIS will be announcing in a few days um, a parallel effort in collaboration with Keidanren. <coughs> um, we'll be establishing a task force um, and, and working over several months to make recommendations for how the U.S. and Japan can collaborate and how the U.S. can support um, and provide expertise and build ties as uh, the Japanese government, Kidanren, Japanese civil society, make their plans for recovery and reconstruction. So today is a, um, an early look. Uh, we'll learn more in the weeks and months ahead about the scope of the challenge. Um, and we have an excellent panel to address this. And at CSIS, with our colleagues at Kidanren, we'll be coming back to this over the coming months with, with more research and uh, recommendations and hope to invite you all to uh, be involved in that. Um, this panel is, um, I think, w well known to many of you. Um, Arthur Alexander on my right is a, an economist. Uh, he's a colleague of mine at Georgetown University, where he teaches a very popular class on the Japanese economy. Um, he was at RAND at many years, um, and uh, for a number of years headed a, an institution here in Washington that many of us miss called the Japan Economic Institute, um, which focused on uh, Japanese political, economic, and foreign policy issues. Um, Yugi Otada is from the Sojitsu Corporation, formerly uh, uh, Nisho Iwai. He was here in Washington at Brookings. He also headed Sojitsu's operations and the Sunrock Institute and uh, is uh, a, a leader in the Keizai Do Yukai, which is the Association of Japanese Business Executives, where he's vice chair of the U.S.-Japan Committee. He's just arrived from Japan a few days ago. Um, for those of you who know Tadasan, his his other, uh, it's not on his resume, so I hope he won't, won't mind me telling you, but for many years, Yukio Tada was a private in the 2nd Rhode Island Infantry, uh, which was a Civil War reenactment unit. <laughs> so if you uh, ever traveled to Antietam or Gettysburg uh, and saw one Japanese private uh, <laughs> marching with the 2nd Rhode Island against the secessionists, sorry, our Louisiana friends, <laughs> from, a, from a solid Yankee family myself, uh, Yukio Tada is a good union man. Um, Probably doesn't have an opportunity to fire his uh, his uh, his musket and his rifle in uh, in Japan. Um, Marcus Noland is a vice uh, director, deputy director, at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, um, PhD from Johns Hopkins. Um, Mark has written um, and influenced policy on exchange rate issues, um, and uh, has been especially, um, uh, I, I think, uh, influential in thinking about uh, unification and reconstruction of North Korea. Very different case from Japan, obviously, but Mark has um, put his head around one of the toughest uh, economic, um, uh, macroeconomic, microeconomic uh, reconstruction challenges we may face in the decades ahead, um, and knows Japan well, having lived in Japan, studied at Saitama University, mm -hmm. and, and been a fellow and associated with Japanese institutions. Um, I'll ask questions for perhaps 30 minutes, and then we'll open it up to the floor. Um, and I have a couple of, we won't have opening presentations. Uh, but I, but I'd li I have a couple of questions I'd like to open up with. I want to first ask, I'll start with, um, start with Arthur and then go to Mark and then Tadasan. Mm -hmm. uh, just in a uh, long-term sense, what you anticipate the economic recovery trajectory will be. We have some precedents like the Kobe earthquake. Mm -hmm. The World Bank has um, put out uh, a, a, a damage assessment of well over $200 billion, but has said economic growth should recover within 2011. There are debates about whether recovery really represents economic growth or just replacing destroyed assets. But to begin with, how would you assess the right. growth trajectory we can expect over the coming years based on what we know? Yeah, uh, complete, you I did bring slides. a few <laughs> slides. Let me, let me I, just to highlight a few of them. I'm going to zip by some of them. I think we can start with this one. Uh, this was the Great Kanto earthquake in uh, 1923. And this is, this is the Ginza area in Tokyo. Uh, and we can look at the vast amount of destruction. There's a few uh, masonry buildings that are standing but we just see block after block. Uh, we can actually look down to the waterfront there, uh, the uh, fishing market, uh, because it's all, it's all disappeared. Uh, and this is, I think, thematic of what I, what, what I will expect and what I'll, what I'll mention. Here it is two years later. Uh, the streetcars are running. The buildings are back. 
Uh, the shoppers are out on the street. Uh, the cars are running. This is a modern society that works. It has competence. It's a rich society. It's a big country. Uh, and it's back working again. I think this is what we can look forward to. Uh, a few, uh, here is the GDP, of going by annual GDP figures, and it's hard to find the earthquake in this. The red line is a general trend line. You can actually see that GDP does go down for that year, but it's hard to dist uh, distinguish from the noise level. Uh, if we look at more of that, here is the Kobe earthquake of 1995. Kobe and the surrounding area was a real center of, of manufacturing, transportation, uh, of economic activity, densely populated. And when we look at this quarterly data, uh, you don't see any impact. There's, there's no blip in the data at all around that. Uh, here is the prefecture uh, for its annual data, uh, 95. It, it goes up, it goes up the next year, and then it comes down. This, Japan was in a, going into recession that year, but for the regional output, we don't see anything. Uh, here is manu just manufacturing. Manufacturing is about 20% of the economy, monthly data. We're, we are getting finer and finer. Can you pick out, there's a lot of noise in the, in the ups and downs. If you squint, you actually see it. If you put a magnifying glass on it, it does pop up. And here's the magnifying glass. And we see that in the month uh, of the earthquake, GDP for the country, or not GDP, manufacturing came down. Uh, it fell 2.5% the month. It went back up most of the way the next month. By the third month, we're back on trend. Uh, tertiary sector services is about 60, 65% of the economy. That fell in the month of the earthquake in the nation as a whole was back up two months later to where it had been. And I think this is the sort of thing uh, that we can expect over the long run. Now, the, the, the blips now are going to be, I think, about twice as big and last for twice as long uh, because of the electricity problems and other things. But I would say six months from now, it'll be a chart looking somewhere like this, a little bit more expen extended, a little bit more of a downturn uh, during the problems, uh, but within six months, uh, we're, because of reconstruction, because of reconfiguring, because of redundancies uh, in the system, we'll be back to where we were. So that's kind of my, my quick response here. Um, and, thank you. Okay. Mark? <coughs> um, <coughs> I think I should warn the audience tonight. I think we have an optimist and somebody who's beyond optimistic. <laughs> I don't think you're going to find a pessimist. No, 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 to, to give a right. sense of yeah. where people are, I don't think there's a pessimist on the panel. There's nobody sitting over on this side of me. Um, I, would, I would largely agree with, with, with Arthur's analysis and just add a couple of, of, we, we can turn of that off now. caveats to it. Um, the Kobe earthquake of 1995 is a reasonable benchmark. Um, the current one is much worse just as an earthquake. Um, and it also presents two additional problems that we didn't see in Kobe, which I think is going to make the economic dislocation both greater and longer lasting. The one, the obvious one, is the nuclear situation. There's no equivalent in the Kobe case of, of this unresolved problem with the damaged nuclear facility. Uh, second is, associated with that, there has been a disruption to the uh, eastern grid of the island of Honshu. Who would have known, but the island of Honshu has two electrical grids. Um, and in some ways, that's nice, because it means the whole country isn't disrupted, or the whole island isn't disrupted. But it also limits the amount of load shifting that one can do. So in areas essentially Tokyo and north, or Tokyo and, and east, uh, there continue to be problems with electricity. And what that means is that the economic dislocation, which is normally confined to a specific region that has been affected by the disaster. Mm. In Kobe, it was Kobe. Um, is being propagated through the electrical grid to other parts of the country, in particular in Tokyo. So that means that in the short run, economic dislocations are probably going to be greater than a typical earthquake or a typical natural disaster, because it's affecting activity beyond the immediate area. We have the uncertainty 
with the uh, nuclear reactors. And the third uncertainty, which is thankfully dissipating, is that we get a major aftershock that either further disrupts the reactors or hits a larger population center. Um, obviously, none of us want to see earthquakes anywhere in the world. Um, in some sense, as strange as this may sound, Japan was lucky in that the city of Sendai is isolated. Uh, the surrounding areas are lightly populated for the most part. If, there, if the earthquake had hit, hit 200 miles to the south, it would have hit Tokyo, which is a metropolitan region of 35 million people. So um, with each passing day, it looks like we've dodged that bullet of a major aftershock that could really further uh, disrupt the situation. So I think Arthur's, Arthur's basically right. We've got a short run problem, decline in activity. Industrial production will surely be down this quarter, will surely be down next quarter. One hopes that rebuilding activities will get underway so that GDP growth will actually accelerate in the second half of the year. Whether it nets out, um, I'm not as convinced. Um, most people were expecting the Japanese economy to grow at, say, 1 or 1.2 percent. Uh, it may not make it this year. Um, but I am confident that, uh, that once these immediate problems with, uh, with, the, with the nuclear issue and the electrical grid are surmounted, that we will see a very uh, forceful rebuilding, uh, rebuilding effort, and that uh, certainly 2012 and so on, um, we'll see a lot of pickup uh, in economic activity and a lot of uh, reconstruction in the uh, Tohoku region. So. Well, uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with the two uh, see, uh, the demands. And then, but uh, my observation is optimistic in the Japanese uh, economy in, in general, but very pessimistic about the Tohoku area, about mm -hmm. how they can recover uh, from kind of this uh, damage this time, because uh, this is a triple disaster. In addition to the 9.0 earthquake, that the 20 meters high tsunami wiped away most of the coastal industry area. And then now this is a nuclear reactor issue. But uh, before that, if you see, uh, unlike two gentlemen, I'm from Tokyo this time, so that uh, most of you may rely on the, uh, TV coverage or CNN, Washington Post. That may uh, sometimes illustrate more than what we really are. So that uh, my role here today is that in, in order to uh, see, uh, my, since I, at the time of the earthquake, I was in Tokyo. So that uh, through, uh, in order to share, share the fair view assessment between uh, I'll, uh, you and I, so that I would like to share my experience uh, at the time of the earthquake. So March the 11th, 2.46 uh, 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 p.m. in the afternoon, I was at the uh, Tokyo, uh, uh, downtown Tokyo Hotel New Otani, and waiting for the Japanese-Americans delegation from the Washington, D.C., headed by Irene Hirano. And then uh, before that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, the session was uh, uh, scheduled between 3 to uh, 4.30. And then our side was a Keizai Douyukai headed by Sakurai-san, uh, 12 uh, the Japanese businessmen waiting for the delegation. And then before that uh, earthquake happened and all the shelves for our base falling down. And then uh, we started the communication how, what is that? Uh, Japanese uh, entrepreneurship and innovation for the remaining one and a half hours for as it is. Uh -huh. And uh, of course, there's an aftershock uh, see, uh, uh, in every 10, sec uh, 10, 10 minutes. But uh, we con concluded. But uh, the, uh, from the courtyard, we can see the old high rising uh, see, building was dancing like a Hawaiian dancer. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, even the uh, uh, most highest uh, uh, structure, the uh, sky, uh, sky tower, we, which uh, reached out uh, 634 meters, still intact. And then, so that is the kind of first impression. OK, that's fine. Structure in, uh, in Japan was not damaged by the earthquake. On the next day in the morning, because I have to go to the Os uh, Osaka early in the morning, so before the, even before the co commuter train start, 7 a.m., I reached out to the uh, Tokyo station and uh, got the Tokaido Shinkansen, but it's plane, and uh, which operate perfect operation and arrive Osaka on time. On time means plus minus 30 seconds, <laughs> not the uh, Am Amway's uh, Amtrak. Amtrak. So just uh, like Amtrak. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> so that the life in Na Nagoya, Osaka is uh, quite normal. So that means 99% of the Japanese population was not affected. And then uh, somehow, you know, that the New York Times following uh, days, weeks, uh, praised the Japanese, you see, about uh, selfless uh, sacrifice, uh, stoicism, or perseverance. But uh, you see, uh, uh, we are Japanese, it's also the uh, human beings. That means that in some way we have a breaking point. Mm -hmm. Of course, my, our breaking point might be higher than uh, that of the American. But uh, since uh, these days, like uh, water contamination or uh, any other see, uh, import, uh, export ban or uh, any, any radiation check at every port, something like that. So those stress is now affecting Japanese. So that, of course, we are quite gamans, perseverance. And, but uh, still, yeah, we need to concern about that. So that also the kind of uh, mood, it may affect the Japanese economy in some way. But the uh, Japanese side, uh, of course, supported by the east, uh, Western part, of course, uh, might be uh, uh, recovered uh, step by step. But uh, still, I don't know how to address to the Tohoku area. Mm. The, um, I lived in Tohoku. Uh, for a while in uh, Iwate Prefecture, which was hit pretty hard. <coughs> um, and uh, uh, I understand that uh, that area accounts for about 4% of GDP. Sendai Port, Arthur mm -hmm. taught me, is about 1% uh, of shipping. Uh, right. But the electrical, water, and other impact will be geographically much broader. We have, in addition to our panelists, CSI experts, uh, Jane Nakano, who's an expert from our energy program, um, Stacey White, who uh, is our expert on disaster, uh, uh, pre prevention and response, and uh, Lisa Carley from Global Health. And maybe, if, I think you all have a, uh, a microphone. If I can put Lisa briefly on the spot, if, you, if there's anything you can interject at this point about what we're starting to hear about some of the health concerns, uh, water safety, food, um, uh, and mental health, if, 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 if there's uh, some insights you can give us at this point. Um, yeah, no, sure. Thanks, thanks very much, uh, Mike. And you know, I, I think I just offer maybe four brief comments of things that I think we need to all be watching as this uh, response unfolds. And you know, they've been highlighted in some articles that have come out in the last week or so. But I, I think you know, the first thing, obviously, to be concerned about is people's physical well-being. And there are very real issues around supply of water and shelter and food, and particularly given the number of elderly affected. Um, how they're dealing with chronic health conditions and supply of medications that are required to treat heart disease and diabetes and other um, conditions that, if left unattended, can actually pose very serious health consequences. I think a second major issue, of course, is around mental health. Mm. And I think what we've seen in other complex emergencies is that there is an effect that actually continues for quite a long period after the actual event, um, certainly in young people. Uh, certainly, actually, in mothers. I think this has been documented in the case of Chernobyl and Three Mile, Three Mile Island, and I think also particularly in the elderly. And I think that's going to bear close watching. Um, there are going to be real challenges around rebuilding some of the physical infrastructure. I think we know that there have been considerable numbers of health personnel lost in the parts of Japan that have been affected, and those people are going to have to be replaced, and those physical facilities are going to have to be rebuilt. And I think the last issue that's going to be um, important is looking at uh, the radiation effects. And um, I guess my impression has been that what's made disaster response effective in many other international circumstances has been an interoperability across um, response agencies so that they speak the same language and know how to address the issues that are unfolding. But I don't think we've quite seen that on the nuclear issue. You know, we have WHO saying one thing, we have IEA, IAEA saying something else, and we don't really have the type of connectivity we probably need to have with uh, national authorities that watch these issues closely. And I think that's going to be something we're going to need to go back and take a second look at. Thank you. Actually, why don't I just go down the line briefly and turn next to Stacy uh, on disaster response, especially, uh, I guess what we would call uh, internally displaced persons. Um, 80,000 plus displaced More. persons. Uh, upward of 100,000, some figures say. Um, w what happens over the coming, there, the Sanriku Kaigan, where I used to go, is just tragic for me to look at. Having been there, it's matchsticks and mud. They can't go home mm -hmm. uh, for some time. They have to, but what happens? What is, over the coming months or even years, how does that transition work when you have displaced persons like that waiting to go back to, uh, a, you know, a, a hometown that's been destroyed by a tsunami? Right. Um, 
I think I would just preface my comments by saying, um, related to what um, Tadasan said, I, I think very much Japan is still in an emergency response phase, and not just in the physical aspect, but also in the psychological point of view. And so we have graphs, so we start talking about recovery and rebuilding, and the very people who need to be leading that effort might not quite be there yet. Um, and when I say those people leading that effort, people think about government. But I mean, one thing we do know, and our folks from Louisiana can tell us, is that you know the local participation is critical to making sure that the design of whether they're transitional homes or permanent resettlements is absolutely key to their sustainability and to their success over time and to the actual uh, revitalization of the economic communities in the Northeast. So one, what I would say in terms of the nuclear situation, I mean, I really don't know at what point these people are going to be able to return to these evacuated areas, but that experience does show us and demonstrates that the closer you can get displaced persons to their communities of origin so that they can live in transitional homing, homes, but they can also be rebuilding their, their livelihoods and their, and their lives while they're living transitionally is the, really the most important thing to do. And that's um, something that's been demonstrated again and again. Another um, sort of positive lesson we might take from the Kashmir earthquake and also from the tsunami in Aceh is that in those cases, the federal government actually brought a unit of administration for reconstruction and rebuilding to the, the region of the country where the greatest uh, devastation had occurred. And that was actually really useful in making sure that um, local people were participating and that their voices were heard in sort of the design and implementation of different programming, but also that you know sort of the red tape and the bureaucracy that can happen at federal government level didn't mean that you know things were slowed or in fact you know inefficient in terms of the, the implementation of some of the reconstruction programs. So um, you know getting people as close to their homes as possible and and making sure that the response effort is as localized as possible is two key points. Thank you. And Jane, um, on the energy front, 29% uh, of Japan's power generation is nuclear, as I understand it. And for TEPCO, for Tokyo Electric Power, it's about 50%. Um, what happens? to the, you know, the distribution of energy uh, uh, supply over the coming months. They're going to be rolling blackouts, I understand, until May. And then the summer will depend on the weather. So the coming months and years, uh, one would expect a lot more LNG to be in that mix. But what, 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 what's the formula you'd expect? Um, so I, it was really interesting to see how many plants have, you know, shut down in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake and tsunami, I guess, in a nuclear uh, sector, there are 50, there are 54 <coughs> operating reactors and the 11 of them shut down uh, either, you know, by, mostly by um, design, well, by design, they all, you know, safely shut down. But then there are also damages uh, to the thermal uh, power plants, you know, um, uh, gas, coal, uh, you know, those power plants as well. And as you said, um, you know, it's now affecting not just the, the folks in the, the northern part of Japan that were struck by these natural disasters, <coughs> but then people in Tokyo where I guess Tokyo accounts for I guess uh, nearly 40% of Japan's GDP, and you know rolling blackouts are you know it, uh, the, even though it's scheduled, it's you know it's 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 not it doesn't make it easy for folks in uh, Tokyo or surrounding areas to focus on uh, some of the you know recovery or, or disaster management uh, tasks um, at hand. Um, I've seen a couple different forecasts. Um, I know that at least in Tohoku region, the ro uh, the schedule rolling blackouts um, are no longer, I guess, scheduled. But in Tokyo area, we're talking surrounding uh, prefectures, I, I guess there are about nine prefectures. Um, you know, it's expected to continue until the end of April, at, le you know, at least. And then, of course, you know, once summer approaches, then uh, I guess as far as to uh, TEPCO or to Tokyo uh, Electric Power Company uh, uh, region goes, I, I guess, it they might fall like about 15 to 20 percent short of the, uh, you know, um, of the peak demand. So obviously, you know, um, right now uh, it's, you know, I think there is much less need even from the industrial sector, you know, uh, manufacturing plants and so. But so, but it'd be interesting to see, um, you know, I, I would how the I guess the recovery from the manufacturing uh, sector may outpace really the uh, recovery from the power producing sector. So that's the key. The timing and scope is, I guess, yet to be known. But, um, and so it's, it's really tough to say, uh, but 
uh, I know there are efforts to restart some of the thermal power plants that have not been in operation, but it might take quite a while. It's not something you can just turn, you know, turn on and you know, get going. It's not like a, you know, water out of faucet. So it might take two to three months. It might take even longer for some of the, the aging uh, power plants. Um, and then, but then I guess the good news, as Mike, you, you mentioned, is LNG. Um, I think there is, uh, for now, uh, in the global LNG market, I think the supply is still there. Um, it's not, it hasn't seen any panic uh, because of this uh, tragedy in Japan. So I think m you know, many folks are turning to LNG as a uh, sort of short-term uh, solution. Um, from what I understand, uh, there's still three out of six refining uh, refineries that, that haven't come back to operation. So but I think Japan has about 60 and only, uh, well, six got damaged and then three are back. So the oil is, you know, oil demand will probably stay pretty low for the immediate future. Um, LNG, uh, you, know, uh, you know, I guess both the government and uh, the Japanese business folks are pretty busy trying to see how much of the LNG uh, cargoes they can secure for now. Um, so uh, there are lots of home. Mm. That's helpful. Thank, thank you to all three of you. Um, you know, there are various collateral effects of this on Japan's foreign policy, and I expect one of them will be that Japan-Russia relations, which were in a very bad place two weeks ago, are going to be transformed. Mm -hmm. uh, you can already see it in uh, the bilateral diplomacy to start preparing for a much more uh, mutually uh, beneficial relationships around uh, LNG. Mm -hmm. um, back to the panel, Let's, uh, one of the other big challenges will be uh, financing the reconstruction. Moody's Investor Services put out a warning that the uh, cost of capital will be high for Japan. There are problems in, anticipated of inflation, of a high yen damaging exports. Um, as insurers, presumably or allegedly, there's some debate about this, recapital, bring capital home to pay um, for damages, or as um, uh, with 200% of GDP, Japan is forced to issue new government bonds. Um, let me turn to you first, Mark, on this question of, um, I guess, can Japan afford it part? And do you see a scenario where maybe the, the IMF or uh, World Bank or others get involved? Uh, um, are the inflation and uh, high yen fears over, overdone? How do you see that side of it? Uh, at this point, no. Uh, I, don't see a, I don't see a scenario in which the IMF or the World Bank would get involved in any major way. I mean, there may be some symbolic actions, but, but not any major way. First of all, I think we need to be, um, we need to be uh, uh, careful here. The estimates that we have are all highly provisional. Remember, we've still got these nuclear reactors out there kind of ticking away that we're not exactly sure what's happening with them. We don't know exactly uh, what is going to be necessary to get the eastern grid back up to being fully functional. Uh, there's some, you know, there are various strategies, including uh, adding additional capacity uh, to ship electricity from Western Japan to Eastern Japan, adding new capacity and so on. So it's all very provisional. The Japanese government has released a figure which is just over $300 billion for reconstruction costs. That's about the same as what one of my colleagues and I calculated on the back of an envelope the other night. It was about $300 billion. There are other estimates out there that are up in the area of six to eight, which strike me as very high. If we take 300, that's about 5% of GDP. So that's, that's, a, that's a big number. Now, there are essentially two ways that one can generate the funds for, for reconstruction. And that's 5% that's of GDP, presumably spread over about three years. Yeah. Okay. One way is uh, to issue new debt. And we hear this figure of more than 200% of GDP, which you mentioned. That figure is factually correct, uh, but it's also uh, a, a bit misleading. Uh, much of that debt, about 100% of GDP's worth, is owed by one Japanese agent, government agency to another. And much of that is backed up with, with, um, with assets that generate real revenue streams. As anybody who's ever driven on the Japanese equivalent of an interstate uh, uh, would know, they have tolls that would, <laughs> that would make Americans absolutely you know, die. Okay? So, so real net debt is something north of 100% of GDP. So that's a weak starting point. But it's not, it's not 
a disastrous starting point. Second thing is um, that debt, not for any legal reason, but just a result of private preferences, is overwhelmingly o owned by Japanese residents. Um, and one would have to expect that Japanese residents are less footloose than, say, London hedge funds. So one gets the sense that the government of Japan has more room to maneuver than, say, you know, the government of Portugal or the government of Greece would have in similar circumstances. The IMF says they don't think financing is going to be an issue. Moody's, despite their warning, says they don't anticipate any downgrade in, in uh, the sovereign debt rating. So they have a certain amount of room to maneuver in terms of issuing additional debt. They also have capacity for expenditure switching. Mm. One of the reasons that Japan has such a terrible debt problem is decades of uh, absolutely wasteful public investment driven by the wildly disproportionate influence that lightly populated rural districts have on national decision making. Mm -hmm. So you had bridges to nowhere. You had sp small fishing villages getting modern port facilities. You had uh, bullet trains going through you know, bucolic rural areas. Um, that stuff can stop, mm -hmm. at least temporarily. And money that would have gone into those white elephants can be diverted to building uh, Tohoku. One of the things that I found most heartening, if you're looking for silver linings in this disaster, is the rapidity in which the Japanese political system seems to be moving beyond this, beyond just switching expenditures from you know, white elephant public investment projects. But they're actually talking about real belt tightening. Uh, the uh, the uh, ruling party, the, Democrat, uh, the Democratic Party of Japan, is talking about putting agricultural subsidies on the table, cutting subsidies to agriculture in order to generate funds for rebuilding Sendai. Mm -hmm. The opposition party countered by putting child care subsidies on the table and cut some child care subsidies to re rebuild Sendai. So there's politics involved. Uh, this isn't complete kumbaya. But it is striking, especially if you compare the Japanese political response to our response to 9-11, mm. that instead of talking about tax cuts, they're talking about shared sacrifice. Now, I have some colleagues who think that maybe this is not the moment for shared sacrifice. They would make an argument about Kane, lack of Keynesian aggregate demand, and maybe you don't want to cut those subsidies, maybe you just want to finance more. We can get into that if you want. But I think the basic issue is, there's still a lot of uncertainty about how much this is going to cost. Mm. The government of Japan has more cards to play that may, than may be immediately apparent. And while we don't have a government of national unity, I have been struck by the willingness of both the major political parties to put current expenditures uh, on the table as a mechanism for generating funds for rebuilding on, and not just uh, uh, financing or, uh, or shifting patterns of public investment. Okay, three things I would like to mention. First, international financial institution, you know that uh, uh, JBIC exposure is bigger than the World Bank. And uh, Japan you know, ha has been a major donor for the, all the financial institutions. So that uh, regarding the international you know, uh, aid, uh, aid from the, those institutions, I don't think it's feasible. But the second thing is the Japanese economy or Japanese financial market is quite vulnerable to the attack uh, speculative uh, activities. So that uh, the last week, such as uh, G7's uh, coordinations, and <coughs> just send a strong message to the financial market, or uh, so those kind of assistance is quite helpful. But uh, still, we need our own political leadership uh, to control everything. The, yeah. Well, Mark mentioned um, hedge funds in London. You mentioned Japan's vulnerability to speculation. I've heard from friends in Tokyo uh, some sort of resentment that perhaps the high yen is being driven by uh, hedge funds or outside forces. Is this something that will become a political problem, you think, or cause a major backlash against uh, Yes, but so hedge funds or the international <laughs> economy in general? Well, let me, let me yeah. say the. Uh, as soon as I heard about the earthquake, I sent out emails on various lists that I was on saying, expect the yen to rise. Uh, and for a very simple reason is that uh, a lot of the 
investment from Japan, the funds that are going abroad now. Japan is a net exporter of capital to the rest of the world. Mm. A lot of that will be staying home. So instead of going abroad, it's staying home. And the effect of that on exchange rate will be to tend to drive up the, uh, the yen. It happened after Kobe. Uh, and a lot of people say, well, there's a lot of other reasons that happened after Kobe. Remember, there was Nick Leeson at Barings Bank who was investing in, in uh, Tokyo uh, stock market futures. And that had collapsed and things. But uh, my interpretation at the time was it was because of the earthquake. A lot of money, reconstruction money, would be invested in Japan. And the same thing even more today. And as soon, and it don't have to have like speculators and nasty hedge funds and so on out there uh, betting on all of this. But in some way, the market works to immediately back up that, back up the things that will happen in the future in today's prices. And immediately, we started seeing the uh, yen spiking up. It was driven down by the uh, intervention. Uh, and we have started to see a continuation of drifting higher since then. I think people are worried about more interventions or something uh, that interventions uh, can do in the short run, but not in the long run. You look a little quizzical about all this. Well, I, I, I mean, I think the idea that the yen would rise in response because of repatriation of funds by insurance companies or Japanese individuals, I think is, is quite reasonable. I share that interpretation. But if you were sitting at your computer screen, like I was the other night, when the yen spiked 5 yen in 30 minutes, right. I, I think it would be There's hard to see. something else going on. That, that was not you know, something that was very, uh, that was both unusual and not particularly constructive. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that you know, part of the, Part of the story is, is just sort of prosaic. The market had closed here. It hadn't yet opened up in Japan. So it was only Australia and New Zealand that were open. So it was thin trading. It didn't take a lot of money to move the market. But I think the G7 intervention in that circumstance was entirely appropriate. Because basically what the G7 was saying was that we can't fix your nuclear reactor. <laughs> but we can put the, our thumb on the scale so that nobody you know, in London or New York gets the idea that maybe we can make a quick buck on this situation. And so I think it's kind of an insurance policy. Um, you know, that was a reasonable thing. And that having eliminated that extreme volatility, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you're going to see this general upward drift in, in the exchange rate, which I think is appropriate for the reasons you say. Right. Does, it, okay. does it become a problem if that upward drift uh, uh, starts to make exports uncompetitive and could it become something that's, that, that, that would change your relative optimism about the mm. economic uh, trajectory over the coming years? Mm. Does the drift become dangerous in a sustained or structural way, in other words? Well, being the proverbial two-handed right. economy. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Um, <laughs> you can make an argument that actually having a little bit of, you know, a little bit of depreciation to kind of help the traded goods in sector get you know, kind of pushed along is desirable. Mm. But if you think that... Um, that Japan is going to have to keep more savings at home mm -hmm. for reconstruction purposes, that process is going to be consistent with a, a, a more highly valued yen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you agree? Yeah. yeah. What about um, the idea that out of this uh, disaster will become, uh, there, there will be a new um, uh, uh, spur for innovation, fuel cell technology? I mean, if nuclear is not mm. going to be as attractive politically or technologically, uh, shale oil or other things. Do you see this um, spinning off uh, innovation and technologies that might also have a beneficial impact, or is that no. too speculative? No, no, uh, no. I don't think. And so. Oh, there, there are changed incentives. There will be changed incentives yeah. to do things, but I think the liquefied natural gas yeah. is where the incentive will lead, uh, and perhaps companies being more conscious of having some of their own self-generation equipment uh, mm -hmm. at hand mm -hmm. uh, for emergencies if they can. We may be, uh, I'd uh, like to know your, your view of that. Will some of the, a uh, lot of companies now be buying some of the big turbines uh, to generate power for their own mm -hmm. facilities and then perhaps feeding off whatever is left into the grid? Uh, are we see, likely to see that? Are we seeing that right now? Do you want to answer that, Jane? Then I'll go to Mark and, okay, and, yeah, and to oh, you. Yeah. Question. I don't have that much to add to it. I know that um, at least when it comes to that issue, I know uh, more activities back I mean, here in the U.S. As, as opposed to in Japan. But I agree with you. I think the LNG. Um, so there might be a you know, greater interest in 
um, you know, f uh, fuel cell, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, technology. But I think, in general, if I may add, I, I think if it's really if the if we are to invest or you know look more into technology, I think then perhaps um, you know it, we, I don't think we can really dismiss nuclear. I mean, you know, we're the Fukushima folks are dealing with ge second generation technologies, and it's. I mean, there has been quite done in the past 40 years. The, the, so I think technology is, is one of the key, uh, <coughs> uh, you know, keys. But then, you know, then, you know, I guess the nuclear technology should be one of the, the you know, list of technology areas to, to look at. Uh, mm. but, but, you know, the shale gas is also an interesting one. Uh, I, I don't think Japan has really shale gas reserve. Um, I've been looking at uh, shale gas reserves in China and India. In, uh, recently. Uh, but there may be, you know, greater interest in some of the regional uh, Asia-Pacific countries, uh, you know, looking hot, you know, harder at their reserve levels and how to develop them. And, and perhaps, I mean, that would definitely have an impact on uh, the regional LNG market. Uh, I'm not saying that they might start exporting right away or any kind so soon, but, you know, if uh, maybe these are all um, uh, potential uh, the solutions to some of the challenges that Japanese, uh, you know, will, uh, will have to address. Thanks. Let me turn to Mark and, and Yukio, and then I'll open it up on this question of innovation. And All right. I feel about your question the way that uh, <laughs> Joe and Life uh, re re reputedly uh, felt when asked about the French Revolution. Which, by the way, is an urban legend, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. To, to Henry Kissinger? Yeah. It's yeah. <laughs> it's too early to say. Um, look. <laughs> If, if, the, if the problems in Fukushima are brought under control and, you know, we don't get radioactive tap water in Tokyo and so on, then um, there, may be, uh, there may be reactions in Japan, maybe not more broadly. If, God forbid, the situation in, to in Fukushima really turned south uh, and you got, you know, something that looked more like Chernobyl than Three Mile Island, then it will have more profound impact on the political reaction, and it's, it's regulatory changes that will drive some of the innovation because it will create incentives uh, for alternative technologies. So I think in that sense, it really is too early to say until we see exactly how the nuclear situation plays out. Um, beyond that, my, I would expect that you would see one of the responses that you would see over the medium run in Japan to this tragedy is renewed emphasis on these kinds of of engineering and techn technological solutions. And one of the issues that uh, the government of Japan is going to confront uh, is exactly how to manage and organize and what is the vision for rebuilding Sendai. And Sendai, in an odd sort of way, despite its isolation, had a high-tech industry. And one can imagine um, Rebuilding Sendai in a way that it actually, that you try to make it an attractive growth pole in northern Japan, attracting high tech. You try to make its relative <coughs> isolation um, an advantage mm -hmm. in terms of lower cost housing, in terms of recreational activities. I mean, think of an American city that's not pinned on, you know, the Washington, Boston, you know, corridor. <laughs> and there are some attractive aspects to that. So the government of Japan could actually push that, that process forward, possibly. But that requires vision. That requires planning. And, and we're simply too early in this process I mean, you know, for, for that to, to really you know, assume its proper place on the agenda. Hmm. Thanks. OK, so innovation is one of the key areas we discussed during the uh, earthquake together. During the actual earthquake. Ar actual yes. earthquake. While it was shaking well, the building. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that, that, That's a I, Japanese trading company. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's strategic thinking. Yeah. Japanese Americans are uh, asking Keizai Doika at that time why Jap Japan lacked uh, entrepreneurship or innovation. And my uh, observation was uh, in, in this way, OK, in case of the uh, innovation. There's a uh, four type in my uh, uh, sense. The first one is state of art technology, the invention of the kind of uh, high tech or anything is uh, based on like a, uh, during the Cold War. Uh, Cold War, it's a kind of from the military technology. Spin -off. That spin off to the conversion technology became the ICT, uh, FT, or ET, or whatever. 
And then that, in, in, in case of the United States, the second innovation was came from the, uh, uh, the venture capital or very adventurous uh, financer who put the money from, from the Series A. But uh, those uh, first and second type of innovation was not developed in Japan because of the, the peace constitution or whatever. But the third one, that's, uh, and the fourth one, there is one, uh, another type of innovation that is mass production, kaizen, mm -hmm. or uh, see, production management, that is the third category. The fourth one for the user size necessity, like a TV, uh, Nintendo game, now contribute to the see, age of society, to healthcare, or whatsoever. So that uh, in this line, we, we pick it, uh, I, I like to pick up the third one, the fourth one, so that instead of a pure cell type uh, set of art technology, maybe that hybrid car uh, will have an extra outlet which can use to the kind of uh, refrigerator during the uh, power out, uh, 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 blackout, mm -hmm. or those kind of uh, uh, functional, uh, additional function or mass production to put into more kind of daily uses, or like a we without a screen uh, in, in that uh, devastated area. So those kind of uh, mm. uh, necessity-based innovation mm. were coming out based on our uh, damage. So life. you think there will be innovation, but it will be in places we wouldn't normally have expected it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. All right, let's open the, 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 the uh, discussion to the audience. We have microphones. If you raise oh, your hand. A lot of, lot of hands. Yeah, I'll call <laughs> on people. If you want to direct it to someone specific, let me know right here. Where's our microphone team? Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, my name is Kawa uh, Hiro Kawauchi, the World Bank. And uh, yes, uh, it is a very interesting presentation. And I agree uh, with you that I am not so pessimistic about the future of the Japanese economy's recovery. And uh, I don't worry about the financing or the public expenditures or recovering uh, reconstruction costs by issuing the government, government bond. But, uh, one thing I worry about is uh, the confidence, private consumption, the consumer's confidence uh, in Japanese uh, society. Mm. The main difference uh, between the, this time and the, the time at the previous two earthquakes is uh, that now the Japanese society is a very, very aging society, and uh, almost 70% of the, our household financial assets are owned by the people over 65 years old. And uh, I don't think that uh, their uh, confidence uh, of the consumer or private consumption is uh, recovering uh, so fast after the, this kind of the, uh, very horrific experiences. And uh, so, and, uh, yes, as you know, the, most of the uh, event or entertainment are now canceled all over the Japan. And, uh, that is because the sharing the sacrifice or the, uh, because of the power outage or the nuclear issues. Mm. And uh, so private consumption has a very big impact. That is uh, almost 60% of the, our GDP. So I think that uh, it is uh, not so yes, small thing. So if you have some comment on that, I'm very uh, welcome that. Thank you. Who wants to go first? Arthur? Um, purely <laughs> conjectural. Yeah. Okay. Uh, not based on evidence, but uh, a little bit of evidence. Um, I think that after, much of the uh, initial consumption hit that we have seen in the past, uh, in, in Kobe, for example, was because people couldn't get out, they couldn't get to the shops, there was production shut down uh, mm. in the immediate area, the, the trains, the metros, the subways weren't working. Uh, and we did see a hit to consumption. See, uh, consumption did decline. But uh, within a very short time, uh, it resumed uh, right back on the trajectory within, within about a month or two, a, r a very short time. Uh, I, don't, I don't think uh, the people who are away from the disaster area uh, are very much taken up with it while it's happening, but it quickly tends to fade. I mean, you, you said you took the subway or took the bullet train the next day. Mm -hmm. uh, even in the pictures he brought when they were, while the earthquake was going on, people continued their lunch. Uh, and uh, I think, this, as I say, purely conjectural and based on a little bit of uh, you know, information that's been there, I don't, I don't think we're going to see that loss of confidence, the people uh, saying, you know, why buy anything, it's all over, uh, that, that kind of thing. We, uh, in fact, I would suspect that down in Fukuoka, which is distant from the earthquake, uh, people are continuing their normal lives mm -hmm. as though nothing had happened. Uh, I would actually like to see talk to restaurant keepers down there in the south 
how are things going? Are you seeing any change? And I suspect uh, maybe on the day or so of the earthquake, the, the, for a day or two after, there may have been an effect if people were glued to their television set. And their, but I, I, I haven't seen that evidence, but I, I would like to, and I, I would predict that there was very little effect down there. Mm -hmm. but, but, yeah. but you were there, and what do you, what do you say? Yes, uh, <laughs> so on the next day I was in Osaka, and the, the life in Osaka was totally different uh, from the say, uh, talk area, so that their consumption attitude is quite active. <laughs> and uh, so <coughs> just the way they are, so that uh, I don't see, see any differences, uh, uh, even after, soon after the earthquake. And the Tokyo area, of course, uh, some of the consumption soared, like a toilet paper or a pet <laughs> bottle. I don't know why Japanese are uh, toilet paper addiction, <laughs> but uh, any, any event, uh, oil shock, <laughs> or earthquake, the first thing that we buy is a toilet paper. So that uh, in this way, it's a kind of peculiar consumption style. But <laughs> on a whole, <laughs> on a whole uh, see in the Japanese economy, so as I said, from western part, uh, we'll push up step by step toward the north. But mm. still, I don't know how to address to the Tohoku mm. issue. Maybe you have a better No, I don't know, but I saw that diapers also sold out. But with <laughs> Japan's aging society, it wasn't clear which, <laughs> which kind. Um, I actually think I'm probably in greater sympathy uh, with your concerns than, than the other panelists. Um, I, and, but perhaps for a different set of reasons. Um, when Arthur showed those pictures of the great Kanto earthquake, uh, one of the things he forgot to mention was that 140,000 people were killed. Uh, among those were thousands of uh, ethnic Koreans and other minorities that were slaughtered by mobs uh, who had been told by the popular press and some government officials mm -hmm. that they were poisoning wells. Um, and the inability, at least relatively perceived inability, of the civilian leadership to respond to this crisis led to a declaration of martial law and was a contributing factor, certainly not the sole factor. Uh, the Great Depression had something to do with it, uh, but a contributing factor to the eventual rise of Japanese militarism. Um, and I'm certainly not saying this is going to happen now, but my point is that these kinds of disasters can have profound political effects. And what we have now in Japan is a very strange situation. You've had for almost 60 years um, a single party dominant system where one political party, the Liberal Democratic Party, governed almost continuously since the end of the American military occupation following the Second World War. Mm -hmm. The government we have now, the, the De Democratic Party of Japan, uh, was really flailing. I mean, they came to power uh, two years ago. They were really flailing. And they've been put in a situation which I think is probably um, <laughs> probably un sadly kind of understandable for, for our guests from uh, Louisiana, that in the kind of fog of war that accompanies this sort of disaster, government officials will make misstatements, they will inadvertently spread uh, misinformation and so on, not because they're trying to do anything, just because it's an extremely chaotic and confusing situation. Um, if they turn out to do well, if they can get the nuclear problem under control, if they can appear to be competent, forceful, even heroic in the way they respond, I think that this could probably go a long way to cementing a true two-party system in Japan, which would open up a lot of doors for Japan to deal with a whole bunch of issues uh, in a more transparent and forthright way than they've been dealt with in the past. However, if the current unease with this government deepens, um, if, and, and I don't want to insult anybody in the audience, but if this looks more like the Bush administration or Hurricane Katrina, then you could have not only an alteration in power among the political parties, um, but in the Japanese case, you could have actually a restoration of the status quo ante as it existed for most of the last half century of essentially one party uh, running the country. And so I think the confidence issue is actually a very deep issue. I wouldn't, to me, I wouldn't tag it on the aging population so much, but basically the possibility that the population could really lose confidence in the, in the current government. Um, and that could really have a depressing effect on people's uh, uh, future outlook and as a consequence their economic behavior. 
Well, I, I, to, I have to add that going into this crisis, the DPJ had about as low a level of public confidence as it's possible to have with something like less than 15% of the public mm -hmm. saying they support the, the, the party. <clears throat> the LDP hovers at around 12, 13, 14. They, they compete in that very, very, very low end of public support. <clears throat> um, my, I agree with what you said. I, I, I wonder whether Prime Minister Khan can survive this in the long run. I don't think they can replace him in the, in the near term to midterm. There has to be a supplemental budget. Mm. Again, another one in June or July. Can't even hold elections in parts of Japan right now. I think it will be hard for him. Uh, and there will be, I would suspect, there will be repercussions. Whether that affects the DPJ as a whole compared to the LDP is a much more open question. Um, and uh, uh, we'll see. But I, uh, I, I remember the Kobe earthquake. In 95, Moriyama was prime minister. Yeah. He was a socialist. It happened in January 95. He stepped down a year later. Hmm. So it didn't immediately yeah. do him yeah. in. But it was one of the things that um, really made Hashimoto, his successor, much more credible. Because Hashimoto was focusing on crisis management, um, uh, on competence hmm. uh, as a same coalition, but as a contrast and as an alternative to, Hash to uh, Moriyama, who he replaced. I think you'll see politicians start brandishing their credentials as competent um, policy manager, professionals yeah, right. and crisis managers. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, and you'll see certain kinds of politicians now emerging. Whereas before you had kind of populists, I think you'll start seeing people who have, who have, uh, have, have credibility as crisis managers. That doesn't mean militarists or rightists. Mm -hmm. I think it's a much healthier thing than that. <laughs> but, uh, but that's what happened in 95. I wouldn't be surprised to see that happening. Uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the year ahead, not in the months, but in the year ahead, uh, because you, in the middle of a crisis like this, you don't change captains. Uh, yes, sir. Right. Thank, thanks for a fine presentation. Leo Bosner, private consultant and retired FEMA. After and a the, former Mansfield, if I'm not mistaken. Pardon me, yeah, 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 yeah a, a Mansfield uh, yeah. graduate. Um, um, after the Kobe quake, there was a lot of talk in Japan about should they create an agency like FEMA, some kind of a national capability to coordinate. And I've been part of those discussions. I was in Tokyo lecture in the week of the quake. But 16 years later, they're still having discussions. And from what I'm hearing back, when the reports come out, they are having a lot of problems coordinating effectively because they don't really have any agency or plan to do this in the Japan government. Do you think this will be enough of an impetus for them to actually either create a FEMA-like agency or create a true national uh, disaster response plan in Japan? Wow, yeah. <laughs> I do hope that the, any kind of FEMA-type things, the Homeland Security, uh, uh, is uh, hopefully uh, see, uh, cre create in the future. But uh, see, uh, the main problem is the lack of the political leadership. Because uh, although FEMA worked perfectly, but uh, still is it like a NSC type controls everything to make a necessary mm -hmm. implementation. So that uh, we lacking those uh, both side of the function now. So that uh, so that going back to the. We are uh, really depends on the kind of, uh, creation of new political leadership, whatever. I, I think um, I think your interactions over the years, FEMA's and yours personally with Japan, have been have been well received. And there, before the DBJ came to power, there was a growing movement to create a national security council mm -hmm. staff and um, more effective homeland and uh, emergency management. The DPJ put that on hold, and the DPJ's theme has been politicians will take the lead since bureaucrats will listen. I think now bureaucrats will have a lot more credibility vis-a-vis -vis the politicians, and some of these ideas about National Security Council and crisis management will come back. Mm -hmm. The big difference will be the, the F in FEMA, the federal. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Japan's not a federal system, so the relationship between state and local government and the central government is much more seamless than in our mm -hmm. system. And so it would probably not look like FEMA, but I think that trend will, will probably come back. I don't yeah. know if you, either of you want to go ahead. Yeah. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Um, my name is Peter Hyde. Um, I'm sort of an interested bystander and a sympathizer uh, to the situation. My, my question is for Tadasan. Um, I have experience in media relations in the nuclear industry, and one of the things that, that happens here is that we have a very close cooperation between state and local government in the event of a disaster, and we immediately form a joint information center. Um, and it seems as though in this particular instance there was a communication gap between the government and, and TEPCO, uh, which is understandable given the nature of the severity of the event and the unfolding fast-moving event. But do you see, apropos of what this, the, the question you just discussed, 
a changing relationship between the government and business entities in Japan in terms of cooperation, and um, how do you see that evolving, if I may? Okay, uh, Keiran Ren stands up. You see, uh, that is a quite a big uh, uh, message. Uh, to restore the Japanese economy. Because, uh, for example, the loading uh, uh, scheduled uh, back out, uh, and uh, Keizai do Yukai Japanese business community oppose those kind of things. Rather, we like to control to make a seeding of the peak consumption by industry or by company or whatever. So those kind of the uh, initiatives are now going on. And that may affect a more better relationship uh, in, in such a kind of coordination. But uh, the, the most of the reason, I, I'm, I'm a little bit uh, sympathy to the TEPCO's uh, behavior because a uh, NIMBY, not in my backyard. See, not, that is not the Okinawa issue, but also nuclear as a power uh, site uh, uh, is always needs a series of public acceptance. So that means they said they have had, uh, TEPCO had a hard time to get the kind of public acceptance to do any kind of the measure. But uh, based on that kind of recent development, those NIMBY or PA's issue is a more serious issue. So that is a kind of negative th side um, uh, in the future. It's interesting, though. That is it, did I understand you quite correctly that, there are, that the standard operating procedure in a nuclear crisis in the US is to immediately set up a joint government and it industry communication strategy? Mm -hmm. but, but there are four different levels of mm -hmm. severity. But if it's a, se a serious issue, the state usually takes over almost immediately, and mm -hmm. the governor de makes determinations, and, and uh, business, business cooperates yeah. uh, and sort of takes a back seat to mm -hmm. what the state does. And so it just seemed in this case you had a polar opposites in TEPCO and the government. Mm -hmm. That's all. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Masahiro Sakamoto from Japan. I have a question to uh, Chairman, Mr. Green, and Tada-san. Uh, uh, hmm. uh, what what uh, this crisis has an impact on U.S.-Japan relationship, uh, especially the uh, in view of the uh, so uh, huge effort of uh, U.S. forces in, in in tackling this crisis? What uh, do you think of? Do you want me to go first? Um, well, there were some missteps um, and miscues, uh, as there always are in a crisis like this. Um, uh, I was concerned at first that the different explanation of the danger levels from radiation coming out of U.S. forces and the U.S. government and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the difference from, from our 50-mile uh, exclusion zone compared with the Japanese governments, would breed resentment or friction. Uh, but it's been several days, and I don't think, reading Japanese editorials and so forth, that that, that will be the case. Mm -hmm. And it looks like, overwhelmingly, the impression in the Japanese press and of the Japanese public is that Operation Tomodachi, the U.S. response, was just extremely well received. The uh, New York Times had an article yesterday uh, which described on the ground some of the reactions of the Japanese who were rescued. Mm -hmm. And um, going into this crisis, Polls showed 75, 76 percent support for the alliance in Japan. I wouldn't be surprised if those numbers go up uh, because of the uh, because of the way it was uh, it was managed together. There are still sensitivities, though, and I think in the U.S. side we have to be careful. The re response and reconstruction strategy will be led by Japan. Um, uh, the uh, U.S. will partner, but this is going to have to be a Japanese and will, of course, naturally be a Japanese-led effort. And the U.S. side is going to have to figure out where where can we help. Um, and if the administration is careful about that and is not telling Japan what and how it should do things, um, I think this will be an experience that shows how important the relationship and the alliance and military presence is to Japan. All of that said, the perennial problem on Futenma, Futenma of the U.S. Marine Corps base, mm. this it doesn't change that. I mean, that's still going to be – that's a NIMBY problem. NIMBY problems, mm. you know, are uh, uh, resistant to big change. Yeah, uh, still. Okay, my observation is, uh, yeah, U.S.-Japan uh, relationship clearly yeah, improved. Uh, see, despite the fact <coughs> that uh, it's, uh, current administration is not facing good to the U.S. size, but the status quo-wise, U.S. Marine and U.S. Navy was quite cooperative in uh, humanitarian uh, disaster relief. But uh, uh, 
uh, using a lot of the like uh, airport facility in mm -hmm. Sendai or Yamagata, and then uh, uh, USS uh, Ronald Reagan, mm -hmm. and that uh, 20 other fleet is uh, uh, helping. So that is a quite good development. But uh, uh, see, uh, in a uh, uh, damaged area, in talk area, going back to the local government, the local government still has uh, so many controls. So that, uh, mm -hmm. see, in case of the anarchy, uh, like uh, uh, Libya, maybe uh, lo lots of us can uh, just uh, set up their own facility or dig the hole anywhere. But uh, we have, in case of the Japanese standard, we have to ask local government whether we can stand, settle the uh, facility here or there. Right. But uh, those kind of commu uh, communication was not yet solved. But the uh, first priority is just address to the damage control or yeah. disaster management. So, but uh, in the short run, it's good. But uh, uh, in the long run, it may cause the uh, next issue. Well, there, should, there will be lessons learned from this. And uh, there were some disconnects. But in the Kobe earthquake, mm -mm. the local government's uh, interaction with the US military and the self-defense forces was somewhere between non-existent and hostile. <laughs> for the first week. And this time, uh, the self-defense forces deployed over 200 helicopters within 48 hours. The US and Japanese forces, mostly Japanese, uh, put Sendai Airport, which had been devastated, back online in about four days. So I think there will be lessons learned. But um, uh, I, I think the general impression is going to be that you know the interoperability and the cooperation was pretty impressive, mm -hmm. especially compared to 95. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think hand up yes. In the back? Yes. Is that, you, you wanted me to? No, no I'm, just, I'm just, pointing them, okay. no, just pointing them out. Hi, I'm Ben Curran with the Federal Emergency Management Agency currently. Uh, I'm <laughs> curious about the strength of the NGO sector in Japan. I, I remember learning about lots of good examples of its uh, contribution post Kobe. And I expect it may be even stronger nowadays. I'm, I'm not sure. Mm. And then in particular, if you're able to, anybody able to? Uh, comment on the, say, mass care in particular, uh, how that might be going, the, the how it's organized in Japan related to supporting those in shelters. Mm -hmm. I know a little bit about this. Stacy or others in the audience may be able to weigh in. Mm -hmm. um, Japan's NGO sector is quite small uh, compared to other OECD countries because the, mm -hmm. traditionally the central government has been so competent and, and powerful. Uh, but. Um, I think uh, the importance of civil society and NGOs has really been spotlighted. Mm -hmm. And there are NGOs like Peace Wins Japan. I'm on the board of Peace Wins USA, their American yeah. counterpart. But Peace Wins Japan has been working with Mercy Corps um, and delivering uh, very quickly and very promptly aid, uh, the Japan Red Cross with help from the American Red Cross. Um, so I think this will spotlight how important civil society and NGOs are. But I think it will also highlight how small that space is in Japan it may be an area for, for, mm -hmm. uh, for the government as it looks as lesson learns to, lessons learned to, yeah. To, yeah. To, to do more. I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, in basically Japanese NGO is a first generation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, uh, in comparison to the U US side, the Harvard University was the first NGO established in the 17th century or something like that. So there's uh, so many generation by generations uh, see, uh, accumulation of the coverage or experience, the fundraising, everything. But in case of Japan, we are just uh, started the NGO's activity. So that all the peace in Japan is quite doing well, but uh, still those are quite minority. Small, yeah. But instead, like uh, corporate citizenship mm. or corporate social responsibility is one of the kind of uh, alternative things to support the NGO activity together with the government. So that uh, we always say that the public-private cooperation or public-private uh, 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 yeah, activity, but uh, if we invite uh, you see, private, uh, pub public, private, NGO, or academic, uh, so <coughs> those kind of the, uh, see, uh, formation uh, will uh, develop mm -hmm. in the near future. So that uh, in, uh, I, uh, we still wait another until the second generation can uh, work uh, together with the first generation. Yeah, there's. Uh, I would just add to that. Uh, what we seem to be seeing in the disaster is a lot of self-organization, uh, you know, just ad hoc groups of people in who have been affected getting together and organizing on their own. In fact, we saw the same thing in Kobe. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
the, it took some time in some of the more isolated areas for the self-defense forces or government, uh, other government agencies to come. Mm -hmm. uh, and they were already up and running, but not from a or, uh, previous organization, but just folks who got together on the spot. Uh, and that's, that actually seems to be, uh, seems to be working. But I'd like to hear, we, you heard about the- uh, Stacy, do you want to weigh the, on this? The people, or, the, the, or the displaced and what, what's happening with them. But what I can say um, is definitely in a disaster like this, this is um, not only a unique period um, in state society relations in terms of the performance um, that a government, um, you know, in the way it can perform vis-a-vis -vis its citizens, but also it can, um, there's a space for a real emergent civil society. So what we want to make sure, I think, in sort of the market government society sort of tripod is that we don't crowd out that space either with international support or with um, just business government interventions, but we actually do leave some sort of space for this to emerge. I mean, in Sri Lanka after the tsunami, there were NGOs sprouting up um, all over the place. Uh, and the same, I think, can be said of, of the New Orleans experience. So um, what I see this from, you know, been, being in the international humanitarian community now for 20 years, you know, who is the humanitarian community? Well, it changes with every disaster, and we will see after this Japanese experience um, what happens. The other thing I've watched, which I think is, is, is really poignant, is that, you know, the Jap Japanese are the biggest donors to humanitarian emergencies around the world year after year after mm. year after year. And what I've read recently is that many of the places where they've been, whether it's Kashmir or um, around the Indian Ocean tsunami, with JICA programs, that now these local NGOs from these places of disaster are now helping um, at the community level in Japan, which I think is really cool. Including Afghanistan. <laughs> yeah. Including, yeah, Kandahar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, the back there. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Jude Egan from the Stevenson Disaster Management Institute. One of the lessons learned uh, from the uh, Louisiana experience is that communities don't really recover until small businesses come back. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't know much about uh, Japanese culture and, and small businesses, so I'm wondering first if someone could say something about that, and then second, uh, maybe give a prognosis as to um, the, we're talking a lot about recovery and rebuilding, but do, are we talking also about small business growth and how important mm -hmm. is that uh, to uh, the, the stricken areas? Hmm. Again, based on what I've seen in the newspapers, uh, this is pretty uh, fragmented information, but I think a lot of the devastated areas, the, the village, the fishing villages, these little farming communities will probably not be coming back. Hmm. Uh, and we see, on the, again, the newspaper reports, uh, a lot of older people who have small shops uh, and so on saying, you know, they're not going back to this area that was wiped out and try to, to, try to restart. And then the question is, in, in the re reconstruction efforts, uh, what is going to happen? We were talking a little bit about this before. Uh, is this the time where they move into the apartment building in the larger city? Uh, are these villages gone forever? Uh, is there this hysteresis loop where we don't retrace the path that we were on but uh, do new things? Uh, and I think these are some of the issues that we're going to have to be addressed, uh, have to be thought about. Uh, do we rebuild the wards that were washed out by the uh, incoming floodwaters? Uh, and I think this is going to be different from New Orleans uh, in that sense, is that uh, a lot of the people were, were older people, uh, had marginal economic existences uh, in, in these areas. And I'm, it's going to be, it's going to be a, a, an issue to see, to see how, this, how this plays out, what kind of voice they have, where they want to go. Do they want to go back to that old village that was just over, uh, swept uh, away, or, or do they want to move into uh, a small apartment building in a, in a town where they can get their mail, where they can do their shopping, where they don't have to wait for the bus to come around and take them to these areas? So this is going to be something to look at. The Japanese government announced $130 billion, I think it is, in special crisis concessional loaning, lending for small businesses. But as Arthur points out, mm -hmm. um, the average age of farmers in Japan is 65 years old. Mm -hmm. That's the average age. And a lot of them, I lived in this part of Japan, are um, part-time farmers. 
Um, and it's an open question what kind of small businesses uh, come back in. But the government is trying, I think, understands exactly the point you've made and is trying to make loans available to help. Mm -hmm. Did you want to? Yeah, and uh, in this time in the Tohok area, so already we marked a nine more than 9,000 victims. And then 65% of the, the victim is aged uh, more than 60 years old. So that, in such a uh, cases, you know that uh, it's, uh, in case of the, uh, I agree totally with the Arthur that uh, yeah, aged people may not uh, return. And then small business uh, operation needs a business opportunity, but uh, who fill the business opportunity in addition to lending money? So you see, lending money is a government reach, but uh, business creation of business uh, opportunity is somehow the private reach issues. And then that is why I'm very pessimistic about that kind of thing. About the, the region as a whole. Mm -hmm. right. But what about a city like Sendai or some of the larger towns mm -hmm. where we'll be getting more concentration of people yeah. moving into those towns? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that is actually, right. yeah, uh, in, in case of Sendai, yes. Uh, and if you right. know that you're constructing a city for an aged population with the mm -hmm. community centers and so on and so forth, in some ways it's an advantage knowing what kind of right. city you're trying to build for what kind of yeah. population. Yeah. Um, other questions? We have time for one or two more. Yes, right here. <coughs> Hi, I'm, uh, Sam Weber from the Can you wait for the mic? Thanks. <coughs> uh, from the Federation of Electric Power Companies of Japan. Uh, oh. And I just wanted to get the... You, you uh, can answer some of our questions. Yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> Afraid not. Maybe uh, but uh, <laughs> I just wanted to get the panel's opinion on uh, the effect of the recovery on two Japanese industries. One being food exports. Uh, we've already seen... Um, quite a run uh, in the U.S. on potassium iodine because of the fears of radiation. So, uh, you know, is there any effect to consumer confidence in Japanese food exports? Uh, and the other would be uh, tourism. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a lot of people have left Japan, uh, mm -hmm. left Tokyo, and they might not be coming back. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'd just be interested to get your opinion on those industries. Why don't we get Imaro-san, you have your hand up. We'll get your question and then finish up right here. <clears throat> Imura from Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. And, uh, uh, as uh, first of all, the, uh, Mr. Green said, the uh, Prime Minister Khan said, the, uh, this is the uh, uh, biggest uh, disaster uh, since the uh, World War II in Japan. And uh, it is uh, very agreeable in the uh, scale and uh, uh, gravity. Uh, but it is important to look back the history to the end of the war and uh, also the uh, procedure of uh, recovery of Japan after the war. And uh, uh, I remember something about the, uh, what the uh, Japan did and what the uh, Japan did not. And uh, it is highly appreciated uh, if someone suggests uh, what Japan should repeat or uh, what Japan should not repeat. Mm. Okay. Mm. Mm. Uh, my first question is, what food exports? Uh, Kobe beef, uh, and I don't think there's a lot of much anything else. High-end melons and strawberries and uh -huh. uh, fruits to Asia, but it's not a huge uh, right. part of uh, And I have actually seen some comments on, uh, uh, on, on the beef uh, that some may be affected, may be irradiated, but I don't, I don't think that's a major issue. Uh, anyone? Mm -hmm. Disagree with that? Uh, okay. Is this the final comment? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So uh, going, uh, I'd like to answer to right. both questions. The first, uh, to Imar-san, so we definitely require the strategic recovery pros, uh, project plan, mm -hmm. like a Japanese-type New Deal, to make a more uh, see, uh, robust economies uh, building. Because like a, as you said, that there was a two grid uh, so, um, p two power grid system for 50 cycle, the 60 cycle, e east and west. But uh, that was uh, uh, or, uh, going back to the Meiji area more than uh, 100 years ago. So that uh, at the time of the World War II, we uh, see uh, after the soon after the World War II, the, all the city was just banished. So that if we introduce the you see, unified uh, uh, electric grid, so uh, uh, this time we, we we didn't need to have a loading blackout this time. So those kind of big strategy was required. And in your cases, like uh, uh, I like to refer to the Prime Minister Khan, he's good at eating contaminated vegetable or any kind of food. So he is uh, one of the best candidates to eat uh, like a spinach <laughs> or a milk every day in front of 
TV. And then in case of tourists, uh, my suggestion, since we have uh, several uh, Jap Japanese mass media, so I'd like to offer the one big proposal to using the former prime ministers and the first ladies who are good to remission mm -hmm. to, to stimulate uh, the economic relationship as, we, as well as the foreign relationship. Because mm -hmm. fortunately, we have uh, enough be, uh, f former prime minister, so that uh, in comparison <laughs> to the uh, like uh, former the greatest president Jimmy Carter, so, so I, I would like to uh, see, uh, see the several prime minister, former prime minister, do the quite a, a good job to restore the uh, relationship and the recovery of the economy. Thank you. So the, the question about what were some of the mi what mistakes may have been made in the post-war reconstruction is an interesting question, and I, I, I'm trying to think. <laughs> of what, what we could cite, what we could look at. Well, you could open the at. box of yeah. uh, Yoshida Shigeru and well, wait for hours, right. but the- No, the, no, there, there the, is, the, there, actually there is one, and this, and, and we've already alluded to it, the role of government and not the role of government. What, what is the appropriate role for government uh, here? Uh, and what should they stay out of? Uh, and we, we've talked about bringing in uh, local representatives to talk about what you want in the local community. Uh, there could be too much government involvement here, which is a tendency in Japan. Look to government to do it. Uh, and I think too much of that would be detrimental. Uh, but then looking both to the local communities uh, to decide and local businesses to provide the opportunities. Now, I remember after Kobe, uh, I had a guy coming into my office at the Japan Economic Institute and saying, what could we do? And I said, and I had just heard about some foreigners in, in, in Washington, D.C., talking about how easy it was to open an office here in Washington, open a business. And apparently, Washington, D.C., City Hall, had a one-stop place where you could go to to open an office. You had your fire department, and your health food inspectors, and your tax people. And you, they all had desks there. and they. Somebody took you around to talk to whoever you had to. And by the end of the day, you had all your licenses and approvals and, or plans of what you had to do. And I suggested this. He said, <sighs> we could never get everybody into one office from all the different departments in the city. Uh, and he says, every, you know, every department wants to have the monopoly of control of what they do. And I said, well, you're talking about a problem of getting businesses started. Uh, and it did take a long time to, to recover some of those. So I think there are some lessons there about the role of government, the role of business, and the role of the uh, uh, public organizations to, and not to try to control things too much. But that's, that's one thing I can come up with. It's a point we'll take, and especially uh, as Keynesian, <laughs> you know, Japanese politicians, especially on the LTP side, had a long addiction to Keynesian pump priming. And uh, it will be important to keep some of these, these, uh, these um, points in mind. Well, the question about tourism is, is amusing to me. Uh, Mike and I both have an affiliation with the East-West Center in Honolulu. And I was doing an interview with Hawaii Public Radio a couple of days ago. And they're worried about tourism in the other direction. <laughs> they're worried about when are the tourists when are the, when the are the Japanese tourists? going to be coming <laughs> back? Yeah, when are they coming back? I said, life is good in Western Japan. The Osaka airport is open, you know. Mm -hmm. um, the thing I take away from this are, are two things. They're in almost, you know, opposite extremes of human existence. Mm -hmm. One thing is, I think, like so many people, I have been really impressed by the resilience of the Japanese people in confronting this adversity. Um, I was on a call-in show the other day, and a young Japanese woman who resides here in the United States uh, saw the, you know, the footage on TV and was getting her parents out of Japan. She said it was like the end of civilization. I thought, no, no, no. I, mean, I was watching TV the other night, and there was somebody from CNN, and he was at one of these distribution centers. And he, one of them, the people had self-organized to distribute materials before the government officials arrived. At another one, they had run out of materials, and the government official was apologizing and, and asking for patience. And the man from CNN was very surprised these people were not rioting and not carrying on. And I thought, no, actually, it, it, is, it is quite a testimony to, to the level of civilization that people are faced with such adversary pulling together. Mm -hmm. So I think on a very micro level, I think there's actually uh, the, the behavior of the Japanese people when confronted with such a tragedy is really quite inspiring. 
The other extreme, I think the one, one of the silver linings we can look for out of this is possibly this is a shock to the system that forces or certainly encourages or enables a reconsideration of some of these practices mm -hmm. that have probably outlived their usefulness. They may have made sense 60 years ago, mm -hmm. but they don't make sense today. And one can hope that um, out of this terrible tragedy, one gets some institutional uh, reform in Japan uh, that makes life easier uh, for Japanese people <coughs> and, uh, and, and basically contributes to a rebuilding and rejuvenation of both the earthquake, of earthquake and tsunami affected regions as well as uh, the nation as a whole. Mm. I think the, to conclude, and that was a very important uh, note for Marcus, the um, uh, Ban Ki-moon, the Secretary General of the UN, mm. had a quite eloquent statement about how much the world owes Japan. And I think looking at the media coverage around the world that this crisis has highlighted that. But I also think it's highlighted, looking at the Japanese coverage, you'd know better having been there, mm -hmm. it's highlighted for Japan how much Japan um, uh, owes the world back and has, and, and, and is, and is a, and, and, and for that reason, I am, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a broader sense, uh, like, like Mark, uh, quite optimistic mm -hmm. uh, about um, the longer term impact on, uh, I guess what I would call Japan's relationship with the world from both sides. Mm -hmm. um, th what we've discussed today is a macroeconomic picture that's difficult but not but hardly impossible. Um, uh, but we started out uh, in our discussion uh, reminding ourselves that uh, this is still a crisis mm -hmm. and that there are still people suffering. And I know a lot of people in this room have done things to help. Um, Georgetown University and the local universities are selling these bands online. Uh, it's a small contribution you can make, American Red Cross, they're mm -hmm. fundraisers. And I know everyone in this room cares about the issue because you're here, but we shouldn't lose sight of that as we look to the long term uh, as well. Um, so I want to thank our colleagues at LSU and my colleagues from CSIS and the panelists. This was a very uh, informative and important discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.